Good evening, everyone, and good evening, everyone online as well. Um, I first met Ian uh, at the US Archaeology Conference uh, on South Uist in the summer of 2017. Uh, this had been arranged by the Islands Book Trust to discuss some priorities for future archaeological research here. And Ian had been invited to give the keynote address at the conference dinner on the final evening. When you read through the list of archaeologists of national renown present at the event, his status in the profession today is clearly evident. For those of us very much on the periphery of archaeological academia, we know Ian as the author of the book titled The Archaeology of Sky and the Western Isles, which was first published 30 years ago in 1992, and this remains a very useful summary of the island's prehistory. Chatting to him in one of the conference breaks, I was struck by how young he appeared, and somewhat overawed and flustered, could think of nothing better to say than, surely you must have written that book when you were still at school. And although, of course, that wasn't true, quite, his PhD and subsequent researches into the Atlantic roundhouses of the Western Isles in the late 1980s had given him the knowledge and authority to write such a book at what was by any standard at a very early point in his academic career. It is hardly surprising then that over the past 30 years, Ian has held many prestigious positions in academia, including professorships at Bradford and Western Universities before taking up his current post as Chair of Archaeology at the University of York in 2019. He was also involved in establishing the Centre for Field Archaeology in Edinburgh, and also spent time as an inspector of ancient monuments for Historic Scotland. His list of academic publications is formidable and include over 130 papers, books and contributions to archaeological journals, and he has been involved in numerous excavations his interests are equally wide ranging across the prehistoric period from the Neolithic to the late medieval and geographically extend into Europe as well as widely across Britain. Although I'm slightly guessing here, I have the notion that his excavations on the shores of Loch Olivat at Grimmish on North Uist in the late 1980s were formative in his career. At the time, his interest definitely lay in the Iron Age period and he has kind of said, when we're having supper just now, that we still are. Uh, and when he started the excavations on Yellen Donald, it was believed that this was an Iron Age island doom, as previously described by Erskine Beveridge in around 1900. But as we are about to hear, things didn't quite turn out as he expected. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome Professor Ian Arnett. Thanks very much, David. Uh, okay. Right. Okay. Thanks. Can we can we get away to the next possible? Very well. Thanks very much. Yeah. So, okay, um, so the site I'm going to be talking about tonight is indeed one that was very formative in my um, career. It was, um, it was actually a site I first encountered, I think, uh, must have been in 1985, um, just before I started my PhD, when I was looking around um, various sites in the Western Isles, thinking about what I was going to do and how I was going to conduct this PhD. Um, so, I'm sure, uh, is that? Uh, how do I forward this one? Yeah, uh, okay, who is the chat panel? Got it. Okay, great. This should be fine now. Right, okay, great. <coughs> so, uh, I'm sure most of you know uh, where Ellen Donald is. It's in the uh, sort of northwest corner of North Uist um, in an area which um, these days and certainly in sort of historic times is is really pretty remote um, even by North Uist standards. There's not a lot of settlement in the vicinity at all. This is um, this is Loch Olivet here. Uh, this is uh, Ellen Donnell. You can just make out this hump of land which is another site called Ellen Olivet that I'll briefly uh, mention too. Um, 
What I'm going to talk about falls into four parts, really. Firstly, uh, how did Ellen Doyle come to be excavated? What were we doing there? What was the purpose of it all? Secondly, and probably most of the talk, really, is uh, what's the sequence of activity? So what did we find? And um, how did we sort of interpret and understand it? And then I'll come to thinking about what is the, the role of the site? What exactly is Ellen Doyle? What was Ellen Doyle in the Neolithic? And I'll wrap up at the end with just talking a little bit about how Ellen Donald relates to wider developments in Neolithic Scotland, particularly some of the things that have been happening really recently about dating the start of the Neolithic and about thinking about the uh, population movements that we now know happened at the start of the Neolithic in Scotland. And Ellen Donald has actually in some ways become more interesting since it was excavated, uh, because now that we've sort of crystallised our chronologies of the early Neolithic in Scotland, we can see that Ellen Donald lies right at the very start of that um, process. So how did it come to be excavated? So, as, as David mentioned, um, Ellen Donald was first looked at um, back in the uh, early 1900s by Erskine Beveridge, and I'm sure this audience knows uh, quite a bit about Erskine Beveridge. He kind of um, excavated pretty much everything within a five kilometer radius of his house on the end of the valley. Um, the recording systems and so on that you used were, were rudimentary, as, as, as we'd expect for that period. Um, but the, the, the legacy that his work did have is that we, had a, we have a tremendous um, knowledge of the, the, the broad chronologies of sites in that region around the Valley Strand and around uh, Mahalabad, uh, which is kind of unparalleled uh, throughout the rest of Scotland, really, having that density of excavation, even if the individual excavations are of mixed quality. Now, Ellen Donnell was not one of uh, Beveridge's favourites. It doesn't really seem to have sparked his interest at all. Uh, it, it was never really published. Uh, we know that um, he, he or his workmen uh, excavated somewhere on the site. And it's kind of classed with the, the general run-of-the-mill Iron Age structures that Beveridge excavated. So there was nothing really to make this site stand out at the time that I first came, and I was looking at all these violent dunes uh, through the islands, um, it seemed to be a perfectly standard, presumably Iron Age um, <clears throat> Iron Dune. So that was that was the situation when I arrived there in 1985. Um, I'm hoping that we can still do the walk tomorrow, and I think most most of you are probably coming coming along. So I'll talk more about the broader landscape and the broader uh, distribution of sites around the loch tomorrow. So I'm not going to say too much about it, except that um, as part of my PhD. Um, I decided to focus on doing limited excavations on a number of sites in this, in this region. And what started off as the Loch Olivant Research Project from 1986 to 92 and broadened out a little into the wider Valley Strand area in the, in the years after that. And um, we were looking at a whole range of different sites of, of, of different periods. Um, I was hoping that Ellen Donald would be the kind of almost control site, it was the standard island doom. It was going to be our sort of, uh, sort of, we weren't going to do a huge amount of work there, we just wanted to sort of confirm it was Iron Age and use that in relation to the dating of some of the other sites. Uh, but the first spade in the ground almost literally showed that this wasn't an Iron Age site at all, and in fact the Iron Age doom became a Neolithic chronic almost immediately. Um, now, thinking about that broader landscape, I just want to uh, kind of flag up uh, through this uh, Google Earth photo, um, where we are. So we've got Mahalava up here. Uh, this is the edge of the, the Valley Strand. And um, the major sites we excavated were Ellen Donald itself. Uh, we excavated uh, the Neolithic, um, the chamber of the Neolithic uh, chamber tomb at Gerisklet over here, um, Bronze Age Burnt Mound site at Cannon Clacken, uh, Iron Age wheelhouse at uh, Ellen Malit. Uh, multi-period site at Ellen Oliver, ranging from the early Iron Age through to the um, 13th, 14th centuries. And the uh, site probably 15th, 16th century date at Drummond and Jared, just in the side of Mahalabad. Uh, all of those are, if you want to read up about any of them, are, are in Proceedings of the Prehistoric Society uh, for various years. Ellen Donald we're hoping to publish in the next couple of years. And um, we, 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 that's a much bigger undertaking that will come out hopefully in monograph form. Okay, to give you a summary first of what, what we found before we get into any of the detail, um, some of the broad characteristics about Ellen Donald. Firstly, it's an immensely long-lived site, far uh, more than we could have predicted. 
Uh, the radiocarbon dates suggest that it probably goes from around about 3750 BC to around about 2800 BC. So it's occupied, um, and, and the nature of that occupation is something I'll talk about later, but it's occupied for, you know, not far off a millennium. <laughs> this early date, as we'll see later, um, suggests that these, the site could be established by first generation farmers coming into the area. We can't prove that obviously, but that's the kind of date that we're looking at for the beginnings of farming in the Western Isles. It was immensely productive in terms of material culture. We have um, the largest um, early Neolithic pottery collection on any site in Britain, 22,000 shards of decorated Neolithic pottery from that little island. And that's a minimum of 1900 vessels that are being represented. Um, so an awful lot of um, pottery was being used um, uh, and broken and deposited on the island itself. And we have a succession, of a very dense uh, build-up of, I've said domestic buildings, and I'll see later, we don't really think they are domestic buildings, but it's not, a, it's not an obvious ritual site. It's not, they're not funerary structures. They're buildings that have uh, hearths that contain pottery, um, that, that look as though they should be domestic, and a, a whole succession of those. And the whole thing, of course, reached from the uh, side of the loch by the stone causeway, and as you see, an earlier uh, timber one. Okay, so that, that's to kind of just orientate you into, into what we're looking at. I now want to look at the sequence of activity in more detail and talk you through what these buildings were like and what kind of activity uh, was. And it's in some ways quite a hard site to uh, get your head around. But I'll start by just showing you the radiocarbon dates. So what you're seeing here is essentially, this is a uh, time scale. So this is important dates from 4,000, 3,000, 2000 BC. These are individual radiocarbon dates from the site that have been statistically analyzed through Bayesian analysis, which basically takes the stratigraphic order of the dates and uses that to constrain the range, date ranges. And there's a number of things that we can see from doing that with Ellen, Ellen Donald. Um, firstly, you can see that in broad terms, we go from around about 3750, this is the sort of modeled start date for the site, to what the radiocarbon dates say anywhere from about 2800 to about 2500. Um, this blue line that I've put in represents what we now understand to be the period when groveware pottery appears in the islands. And there's no groveware pottery at all at Ellen Donald, despite this 22,000 shares of all the stuff. So we think there's a very strong chance that actually the end date is probably about 2800 rather than 2500. You can also see that the dates, they're meant to be in sequence, but they're not in sequence. We've got a number of dates that are slightly out of position. And you see as we go through the, uh, some of the later images that this is, this is because of just the, move, the movements of cereal grains, which is what most of these dates come from, individual cereal grains, uh, through the deposits. So we've got a certain amount of intrusive material that's making its way into the layer you know, below or, or where, where it ought to be. But broadly speaking, we've got a chronology that is is reasonably fixed. Um, sites divided into three periods. There are, the, 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 there are bit, when we were excavating it, we started with level one, level two, level three, level four, and so on. Um, but the easiest way to think of it is an early period, a middle period, and a late period. And basically, with Ellen Donald, as you see, the more you go down, the better the preservation. So the earlier the level, the, the better preserved it is, and the more waterlogged it is and the, the, the less breaking down of organic material you have. So the, the stuff on the top, very badly preserved, gets better as you go down. So we've got, so most of these dates, most of the material we excavated is from what we've called the early period, level 11 at the bottom, up to level six. Then we have this middle period. And then very importantly, we have a period where the site seems to go completely underwater. And we have a nice layer of clay, clean natural clay that seals everything. Uh, sometime around about 3000 BC or shortly after, and then we have some late period reoccupation. So I'm going to talk you through these different periods of what each of them uh, seems to contain. Now, um, I'm not going to show you many detailed sections because it's all, all a bit um, much probably, but um, I, I will come back now and again to this one little chunk of the site which encapsulates quite a lot of the sequence uh, quite nicely. I'll come back to, to make 
various points at various times. But basically, this is a sort of simplified version of a chunk of the section across the centre of the site, and it shows you the relationship between some of the main uh, features. And basically, that early period occupation that I mentioned goes from the bottom of where we stopped excavating, and we'll see why we stopped excavating later, up to here. So this big chunk is the sort of early period. Then that green area is the middle period. The red is the inundation layer. And then everything above that is um, the late, late period reoccupation. So we'll talk through each of these in turn. Stopped moving forward again. Thanks. One of the things that became evident very quickly when excavating Ellen Donald is that the site is entirely artificial. So there's no bedrock anywhere on the islet. Everything is essentially made up of uh, decayed organic deposits, layers of peat ash, remnants of former buildings. So the whole thing has kind of gone like this and just gradually built up. And these layers extend beyond the bounds of the islet that you see above water today. And it's very clear that they ran off into, uh, you know, into the lock, into the water. So in, uh, in 1989, in one of, the, one of the major seasons of excavation, we had um, Dr. Nick Dixon from at that time St. Andrews University, who's also well known for establishing the Scottish Cranach Centre a bit later on, at um, he came out to do, uh, I don't know if you can really call this underwater excavation, but, um, you know, diving on the site and basically extending a trench from the interior where we were working out to the side of the lock. And they were able to demonstrate that the structures that we were finding on the, the main part of the area itself uh, extended out into the lock. And this wasn't what they were finding wasn't just midden or debris that had been chucked over the edge. Uh, they were finding you know, flat horizontal layers that continued these buildings from under where we were digging out into the lock. So the, the, everything they found is earlier than everything we excavated on. Uh, on the island itself. Um, it was too small an area really to, to, to get any real sense of building plans or structures, but um, you can start to see some of the elements which would have made up the decayed deposits that we see on the island. So in this little, this is, this is the island here, that's the causeway, this is the little underwater uh, sondage essentially, and what they were finding in there were, were layers of uh, wooden hurdle work, layers of brushwood, um, stones, posts, uh, things of that kind, again, mixed in with decorated early Neolithic uh, pottery. I'll show you a few photos of the kinds of things that we're finding. So this, and th this wasn't lifted, so this is still under the water. And remember, um, that's one tiny little chunk taken out from the side of the islet, pretty much at random, just extended one of our trenches. Um, if you were to go back and excavate anywhere under the water around El now, now, um, you would be finding the, the extension, the underwater extension of these early Neolithic structures. So you can see this nice piece of hurdle work here, um, little fragments of walling, so three courses surviving here, and again, inter, interweaving timbers that seem to represent activity areas, probably the interiors or the collapsed remains of buildings and building partitions. So that's the kind of stuff that has probably decayed to create what we excavated on the island itself. Okay, so we'll look at the earliest um, or a representative chunk of the earliest um, period uh, structures on, on the island. So here's the causeway. This is the area we excavated. So probably about just under two thirds maybe of the extent of the islet. And this is it blown up here. So you've got the entrance and then this series of buildings. Um, when we were excavating these buildings, initially we thought we were dealing with a series of conjoined Neolithic structures that occupied the whole area of the island. Uh, but as I'll show you, <clears throat> it's become a part, it became apparent during excavation that in fact they're all stratigraphically separate. So only one of these structures exists at any one time. So you've got this uh, periodic replacement and abandonment of buildings. Um, this is, I'm showing you three of them here, but there are six successive buildings in levels 11 to 6, all of them later than what you've just seen underwater, and each of them in its own right multi-phase. So each of these buildings has got at least um, three or four superimposed hearths. 
in one case, I think seven or eight superimposed hearts. So the buildings that were used for a significant period of time um, and then apparently dismantled and um, rebuilt uh, adjacent and partly overlapping in most cases. So you've got um, what we're showing you here are, are, are levels eight, seven, and six, the structures associated with those. Um, this one's earliest, then this one, then this one. I'll show, you, I'll show you these in more detail because what they do is they're all badly preserved, but cumulatively they start to add up to a picture of what these various structures were like. <clears throat> and just to say that the sort of graying out that you see here um, is areas where deposits of this period weren't preserved, where it's been eroded by the, the lock, rising and falling lock levels, which is a major characteristic of the archaeology of the site. Ignore the entrance, I'm going to talk about that later. Okay, so let's look firstly at structure 8.1 uh, over on the left. Um, oh, sorry, I, yeah, this is just back to the section again, and just to, to, just to sort of show you in section what you've just seen on that other slide. In fact, if I can just go back. This, my favourite little bit of section is basically this, this little chunk here, which encapsulates quite a lot. So that's what I'm showing you. And if you look at this section, what you're seeing is uh, structure sevens internal deposits, and it's wall here, and then this is structure six wall and its internal deposits. And luckily in the section, you can see quite clearly that there are deposits which lap over the wall of structure seven and under the wall of structure six. And these are just these are just little lenses of peat ash, essentially. Uh, but we were we were able to build a picture of that succession of buildings. Okay. So this is looking at that uh, at, at level nine, in fact. Um, where you've got something that's fairly typical of the site. Um, it's all, this, the deposits associated with it are just preserved in this area. So you've got the south wall of the building, which is marked out in bold here, with a corner here, some kind of cobbled area that may be the remains of an entrance, and then it just fizzles out. Some kind of internal collapsed stone structure. And then this amazing hearth, which is really the, the most spectacular hearth that we found on the site. But the hearts in general were very well built and they were the only part of the structures that don't seem to have been deliberately taken apart and were abandoned. So hearts seem to have been left in situ, built over and then just left. So if you look at this one, it's already about two metres long um, and incredibly well constructed, uh, nicely paved, nicely curved uh, with these subdivisions within it. So you know, whatever's happening inside this building, uh, presumably is involving the preparation of the cooking of food, and presumably for quite a lot of people, given the size of the, the house. It seems disproportionate to the size of the, the structure, um, from what we can reconstruct with the size of the structure. So this building was out of Houston, is dismantled, and then this structure is uh, built over the top of it, the structure uh, 7.1, and you can see again, central half, Enough of this one is preserved to show this kind of irregular subrectangular construction. Uh, it's never clear where the entrances are on any of these buildings, really. Um, we can just, the, the, these stone footings, we think, were stone footings for some kind of turf wall, certainly organic wall, walling, but probably of turf, which has just been kind of uh, swept away or, or pushed over. And what you get are the wall footings kind of slightly out of situ, but still basically forming the alignments where the walls would have been. And there are gaps, uh, some of which may represent original entrances. So they, they were not monumentally constructed buildings in any sense, but they're quite substantial. Um, so you've got this one, it's about four metres wide, maybe a little bit more. It runs into the section, but it would have been at least six or seven metres long. So these are quite substantial buildings, um, probably comparable with the kind of Neolithic structures that we see in Orkney at places like uh, map of power, which is the same sort of shape and the same sort of size. So in that sense, you know, so far so domestic in terms of uh, what, they, what they look like. Uh, moving on to the next one that, that, that overlies that, this is, um, <coughs> oh sorry, no, this is the same one, this is, this is uh, giving you more of a detailed view of that structure 7.1. Um, we can see some internal features appearing on this one. So you've got the, the multiple face hearth up here, cobbled surface that seems to be associated with it, nice grinding stone built into the wall, and this odd little feature here, which is a series of uh, small collapsed orthostats that seem to have been 
forming a feature up against the wall, which we, this is looking at it from the interior. You can see these have been upright stones against the wall, which have kind of been collapsed down. And they seem to have formed some kind of stone box-like structure. Thinking about the Neolithic and thinking about these kind of features, the closest parlance is probably something like the, 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 the box beds at, at Scarab Bray, but it's by no means an exact comparison. And this, this has been deliberately flattened, deliberately um, pushed over. Um, this is one of the phases of the hearth. And again, you can see another way in which the hearths are constructed at Ellen Donnell, in this case, with the selection of nice water worn <coughs> beach cobbles or river cobbles, maybe. Um, to create this nice little cobbled heart. So a lot of attention has gone into the construction of these, these hearts. When this building goes out of use, then it's overlain by uh, this one at the end, structure 6.1. Um, this is a photograph looking at it from the, from the north end. And this just gives you uh, some sense again. Once we got to th this structure, that side of the island was more waterlogged than the, the rest. And the, in this structure, we started to get the remains of um, organic preservation. So nothing terribly coherent, but you can see in the plan that we have the, the hearth, some kind of internal stone feature, and a series of collapsed timber posts, and all these little triangles represent small wooden stakes that were in situ uh, in the deposits. Um, as I was saying to uh, uh, some of you earlier, one of the extraordinary things about Ellen Donnell that comes out more clearly in some of the uh, later images was that, um, you know, on some sites, of course, organic material doesn't survive. Well, on, on Ellen Donnell, stone didn't survive a lot of the time. Because this material was so waterlogged, a lot of the, um, the stones that formed these structures and these hearts had actually completely, would actually completely disintegrate uh, when it was exposed and excavated. So these, these, um, these stones were almost being trailed flat as we went down. And you can see that on the, the hearth stones the curb stones of the hearth here, particularly, and I'll show you in some uh, some other ones as well, but another one in here. Another nice feature of this house is this in situ uh, saddle quern. And it's one of a number of, um, of saddle querns that we found. This is the only one that's really clearly uh, in situ within the house. And it's absolutely massive. It's uh, you know not far under a metre in length and uh, almost impossible to move. Um, so that, that hasn't travelled very far. And again, suggesting that the processing of of, of, of grain within, within the building. Now, so to go back to the, uh, the entrance works. Um, so this is taking you back to that house I talked about uh, a little bit earlier, uh, but this time I want to focus on uh, what's happening in front of it. The stone causeway that you can see today, if it was on this image, would stop about here. And in fact, when we were excavating, it was clear that the stone causeway was quite superficial where it went up onto the island. But what we did find was that as we then excavated, uh, traces of a much more monumental entrance structure began to emerge, where you've got this uh, stone lined passage, uh, nicely paved, um, and then this series of, um, in this case, upright uh, stones along here with timber posts pushed in behind them. And what we think was happening here is that the structure, the wall of this structure, the south wall of this structure, and this line of upright stones were effectively holding a palisade in place, okay, which has been you know pushed over. And if you uh, if we look in detail at those stones, this is looking at it from the other way. This is the, the wall of the house. These are these upright stones. And if we home in, you can see that the post, in this case, crushed against that upright stone. So you've had basically a, a palisade frontage to the islet in, in that period. I'm not quite sure why that slide's coming in quite so garish, it would find out earlier, but anyway. Um, this is looking at the main um, lined entranceway. So, so the stone causeway, modern stone causeway stops probably about here. Um, then you've got this uh, clean uh, blue kind of lacustrine clay that's naturally formed. Then you've got the stone lined passageway. And in this, in this case, you've got a series of upright stones coming in this direction, same going in that direction. And then a series of timber posts marked by little pegs here, uh, which seem to be the end of some kind of timber causeway uh, that would have gone out to the site. So we think what's happening in this period is you've got timber causeway coming out, 
joining this monumental stone frontage of its paving with a palisade out here. Now this palisade here is earlier than the one I just showed you a minute ago, which is back here. And what we see is with every phase of reconstruction, you see this, this entrance structure being remodeled, changed, moved around. Sometimes we think in response to water level fluctuations. Uh, in other cases, it's not quite so clear why. But broadly then, what we, oh, sorry, and, and it's not just the ones we excavated, we've got other, uh, there are other features extending out into the water. This is Alan Brady, who some of you may know, planning another series of what we're calling hornworks associated with the entrance that seem to relate to multiple different phases of construction, demolition, reconstruction of this entrance area. Uh, this is Alan's, uh, Alan is an archaeological illustrator. He's, he does uh, loads of fantastic uh, images. And this is, this is a, a reconstruction that he did of Alan Donald while we were, uh, while we were excavating. And it kind of shows you what we envisage the site might look like at that point. So as I said, you know, nice timber causeway, we've got the sort of posts of the sand, then this uh, lined uh, paved entranceway with this palisade, which, you know, we don't know if it surrounded the islet or if it just um, uh, blocked the front of the islet, it's not entirely clear. But that's still pretty much what we think the, the, the kind of impression of the island would be. Um, as you were looking out from the shore, as you were walking out to it. At this point, we thought we were dealing with a domestic settlement. So we've got, you know, we've got all the domestic stuff. We've got animals stalled. We've got a nice little canoe being built here. We've got a little house and so on. None of that's true. None of that's right anymore. And I'll explain why later on. The one thing that does work is the building um, with its nice big hearth is probably about right. It's about the right size, shape dimensions and features for what we've been finding. But as to what's going on around it, it's not this picture of domesticity that we see here. Okay, so that's the early period. Um, and that's, that was great. You know, that was um, such a horrible site to excavate. It was a really difficult site to excavate. It was uh, thin lenses of, of wet peat ash and decayed organic material. Um, but the early period excavation was a joy compared to the middle period of excavation where the deposits were essentially the same, but they had been massively eroded and churned over by lock level fluctuations in prehistory. Um, and so we've got a period that probably occupies several hundred years, where really we've got lots of features, but it's extremely difficult to make sense of them as, as buildings. Um, so that's, the, that's the, the, the green deposit that's on here. And you get some, in, you get some impression actually from this slide of the, the way it's been sheared off by lock level change at various times. We'll come back to that a bit later. So when it comes to level five, we, we, we know uh, level five is, is the middle period essentially. When it comes to this level, we know that we've got multiple successive buildings, we've got hearts overlapping hearts, we've got uh, some coastals and so on, lots of, lots of uh, fragmentary bits of walling, but really to, to try and uh, reconstruct any building from it is almost impossible. Um, the entrance changes again. So the entrance that I showed you before um, was basically uh, about here in terms of where, where that palisade line was. Um, in this period, it moves back and we have hornworks coming out here and then it moves back again and we have hornworks coming out here. So we've got the sense that water levels are rising, the is getting smaller, the entrance is being at several points reorientated and, and realigned. Uh, this is a good example of the decay of the stones, and this is part of, the, of, of that same level. And you can see this hard setting, um, the stone is completely, completely disintegrated. There's nothing left of it. And the same with this uh, uh, footing of uh, part of the, the hornworks of the entranceway. Uh, new in this phase were some pits and post holes, which seem to be structural and occupied little fragments of the island. So this little group are up in this little corner here. But didn't seem to extend into anything greater. So we really have very little idea of what's going on in the middle period, other than the character of the activity seems to be the same as what we found in the early period, um, that the material culture is the same and so on, and it's just very badly uh, preserved. And this probably carries on from around about 3500 to about 3000 BC. Um, looking at the construction of the entrance works, um, this is just sort of homing in on some of these phases 
of reconstruction, we can see that that varies quite a lot. So, for example, in this in this phase of entrance allowed here, the the line of the entrance seems to be again fringed by a palisade. You can see these uprights really close together, which we think would have held timber posts in between them. Um, and then the hornworks that come out from there are kind of built in this sort of sectional way with large blocks that look as though they're the foundation for some kind of timber architecture. So again, a mix of a mix of technologies going on in the in the construction of the entrance works, but you still have this uh, ongoing desire to essentially make the island look pretty much the same to someone looking out from the shore. There's always this hidden uh, hidden interior uh, fringed by this by this palisade and approached by this monumental entrance. Okay. That period, which you think is characterized, as I said, by multiple log level fluctuations, and in fact, there are several little discontinuous patches of what appears to be clean lacustrine clay just in, in, in amongst those uh, middle period deposits. That seems to then just come to an end with a complete uh, inundation of the site, which we think happens uh, probably around about 3000, something, something like something like that, that sort of that sort of period. Um, <clears throat> this is what we see. It's very, it's, it, the, the, the subsequent occupation takes lots of holes through this and, and damages it quite badly, but extending essentially across all the bits of the, uh, the island where, where it wasn't subsequently damaged, you can see this nice uniform grey silt, which appears to be uh, laid down by rising log levels over how long a period we don't know. So this could have been laid down, I guess, over a few years, or maybe a century. You have really no way uh, of telling. But it does suggest that the, the islet went out of use completely for that sort of period. And that's this uh, red uh, band on here. Now we think what's happening over this time is that the water level was, it's not just that the site's going underwater and staying underwater, the level, the loft levels must be rising, falling, and rising, and falling. Because you can see that um, this is still prehistoric activity, this orange level here, but when it formed, you already had this distinctive profile where all these earlier layers have already been truncated by log level coming up and going down again. And it's quite clear on that section, it's very clear on other ones too. So all this activity is happening really at a time when this site is, is, is constantly, you know, in trouble from, from flooding of various kinds. Now, at some point, the loft levels must go down again, must recede again. And then we start to see bits and pieces of occupation that don't really, again, are, are occur on, or are preserved on different parts of the island. So this is the late period now. This is level four. There's that little chunk there. All of the contemporary deposits are, are, are eroded away, except for one little corner of, of walling, which does survive, and a few negative features associated with it. Um, Again, the same early Neolithic pottery styles, the same basic building form. In fact, the bit that does survive is actually quite well preserved, but of course, most of the structure completely gone. Then level three, so above that, we have again, this, this structure with a wall coming around here, so sort of sub-oval structure. So it comes around here, it's got a couple of post holes in the wall. We think that's this paved entrance. Another alignment of it here probably came around here, and it has this really quite nice hearth surviving uh, in the middle. And again, a number of negative features associated with it, but this, the deposits associated with it are very, very thin and, um, and, and, and don't survive to any great uh, extent. But it does suggest that the basic activity that's happening on the site is essentially the same as it was pre-inundation. And then we get to the very last, uh, well, last Neolithic uh, activity. When we came to the site, and when Eskin Beverage came to the site, there were these two quite chunky looking rectilinear buildings on the surface, visible as upstanding monuments. So we assumed that they were uh, post medieval, probably quite recent, something like that. And in fact, when we were excavating them, that's still what we assumed that they were. But actually, as we, as we then got down and excavated some of the Neolithic deposits, we, we realized that there was no post Neolithic material associated with any, with any of these. There was Neolithic pottery associated with them. And actually some of the detail of the construction techniques, 
So this stretch of wall here, for example, you can see again contains these upright slabs against these splatter slabs, mirroring the construction of the early period causeway features and some of the buildings that we get in the earlier parts of the sequence. And although we can improve it, and although these buildings were very, very badly eroded, uh, they look quite well preserved here, but I'll show you the section in a minute. Very, there were very few interior deposits associated with them. We think these are probably late Neolithic buildings, or buildings in the period about 3000 to 2800 uh, BC. And these, are, these appear to go with the uh, earliest phase of stone causeway that runs up onto the, onto the island here. Oh yeah, just to point out, so, so this, this sort of central, this central wall, this central part of the island is quite well preserved. You can see as it comes around here, we're just getting bits of stone that kind of mark the probable edge. And we think that's because what's happening is that after abandonment, oh, sorry, that's just a, a detail of that, um, a detail of that same uh, wall construction. Um, again, you're getting lock, lock truncating right up to this wall. That's the wall of that structure that you saw, that's the, the central wall. And everything from here across is just bits of stone that are kind of just being deposited um, in, a, in a fairly low energy environment of truncation. So the stones aren't moving very far, they're still kind of lying pretty much where they would have been, but the deposits associated with them have been basically sucked out of that whole uh, area. So that's kind of that's kind of where we get to in terms of that part of the sequence. Now you probably noticed this great blue hole in the middle of the section. Um, that's an interesting feature, which um, really only it, it's one of these frustrating things. We have this, this section that runs across the centre of the site, and uh, this pit only uh, only really just clips into the section. So when we were excavating in plan, we weren't really particularly aware of it, although it's absolutely massive on the section. But when you clean the section up, we could clearly see. That's it here. Um, we think it's the latest thing that happens in prehistory. Uh, we think it's cut against the wall of this building and that this building then subsequently collapses over it. This is stone from the wall that's collapsing over it. So it's probably happening um, when, this, when this wall is still standing. And it does contain some pottery, which uh, Mike Copper, who's a pottery specialist, suspects maybe of Middle Bronze Age, maybe even Late Bronze Age date. So it's something significantly later. Uh, and it's interesting that it's dug at what would have been the highest point in the island, and possibly the only point in the island that was above water at the time uh, when it was visited. Because we think for, the, for these buildings to survive in any form at all, we suspect that the whole island must be underwater substantially for a very long period uh, after its occupation. Okay, let's see, I'm doing for time. Oh, I've got a Okay, so I'm going to talk quite briefly then about what we think the role of the site was and how it relates to wider developments. Um, I've mentioned pottery assemblage, I haven't really shown you any pottery. Pottery is absolutely fantastic. Um, we've got quite a number of complete or near complete pottery vessels on the site. Uh, characteristically, uh, the main types we have are these baggy so called Hebridean jars. With this chevron decoration on the upper part of the body, uh, and Unston pottery, which is very fine, shallow bowls, all a bit round, round based, um, with a very characteristic decoration that mirrors what we see in Unston ware pottery in Orkney. So we're seeing uh, pottery styles that are very much plugged in and connected to the wider Scottish Neolithic, but also uh, distinctively Hebridean. You don't, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't misplace that pot, for example. Um, really anywhere other than the Hebrides. Um, and one of the things that's amazing about the pottery, Mike Copper did his PhD on the pottery and was banging his head off the wall for, for three plus years about it, is that the pottery just doesn't change. There's a, about a thousand years of activity at Elendono, and if you take the pottery from the very earliest phases and the very latest phases, not that late pit, but the, the latest Neolithic phases, you really can't tell the difference between them at all. There's an incredible conservatism in terms of uh, form, uh, rim shape, decoration. The proportions of different types change, and you can map that over time. But these people were almost obsessively doing the same thing for a very, very long time uh, on this island. Uh, that's just um, a shot of one of the, one of the near complete pots in, in situ. It's a great chunk of pottery that just been kind of slapped onto the floor and, and shattered and then just left. Um, 
and some of the reconstructed plots there. For a long time, we thought Ellen Donna was a settlement. We thought we were excavating a Neolithic settlement. And there's lots of reasons to think that that might be the case. This enormous ceramic assemblage. Uh, I've shown you one of the quern stones for grain and grain. I'll show you more in a minute. Uh, lots of those. Lots of charred seeds, masses of charred hazelnut shells. Uh, bone doesn't survive very well on the site, but there was animal bone. We've got sheep, cattle, um, lots of, well, some fish, um, even some whale bone, and so on. So lots of evidence for. Um, food preparation and cons consumption. We've got these uh, multiple multi-phase hearths. We've got these apparently domestic buildings. So all of that looks domestic, but it's very, very wet. It's very, very floody. And not just now, not just today, but we know we can demonstrate that that flooding was taking place uh, almost continuously throughout the sequence. And at certain points, the whole island went underwater. There's a whole question about why these lock levels keep changing and so on, but they clearly do during the, the Neolithic activity. Um, absence of stalled animals, that reconstruction by Alan Brady that I showed you before, has got you know, a little enclosure with pigs in it and things. Well, there's, there's two main reasons why we know that animals weren't stalled on the island. One of them is the incredibly fine-grained stratigraphy, these little lenses, thin lenses of peat ash that you can trace right across big parts of the site. As soon as you put any domestic animal on that, it's going to get trampled, homogenized. You're going to get much thicker, much more homogenous deposits. And also, we know from the uh, insect remains, we've had a big environmental program of analysis done on the site. There are beetles that are associated with stored dung, which would have been used for fuel, we think, but there are no beetles that are associated with fresh dung. So there doesn't appear to be any indication of fresh dung on the site, and therefore, probably no animals, no live animals uh, present. We've got lots of evidence for charred cereal grain, barley, all of it, essentially, uh, but no chaff, no indication that there was preparation, crop preparation on the site. So this, this, this food preparation, the very final stages, you're grinding your grain into flour and so on, but not those early stages. We've got lots of um, preserved wood, particularly from the underwater deposits, but no evidence of woodworking. We've got some lovely little, I should have put this slide in, I didn't. We've got lovely little rolls of birch bark, that would have been used probably for kindling um, that preserved really nicely, but no indication of woodworking, no waste chips, nothing like that at all. So there's lots of things that we should be seeing on a settlement that we're not seeing on a settlement. Well, that's just to show you some of the querns. I think that's the one I showed you before, top left, uh, and that's just a couple of others, uh, in, probably in situ, although we can't really reconstruct the building plans around those other two. So, it's very, very wet. Nobody wants to live there, essentially. This was, this was just during, this was quite an early stage in the excavation, actually. Uh, rain frequently stopped to play at uh, Ellen Donnell. And in fact, the, the, the final season of excavation was stopped when Ellen Donnell looked like this. Um, and there really wasn't much uh, chance of doing anything more that year, uh, really. Um, we can see it's a ridiculous place to live. It, it would be now, and in prehistory, you know, al almost as much. So what was it? Well, there are some formal parallels between Elendono and the chamber tombs that we see in the Western Isles. I've said that Elendono is not a funerary site uh, in any sense that we can understand at any rate. But when you think about what a chamber tomb, you know, these are contemporary in the islands, uh, would have been like, it does some of the same things. So, you know, Barpalangas here, Gerisclet that we excavated, um, they would have been in use while Elendono was in use. So the people who used Elendono would have buried at least some of the dead in these chamber tombs. And so Ellen Donald shares certain things. It's removed from daily life. The, the, the tombs are kind of on the edge of the occupied land. Ellen Donald is, you have to traverse this causeway to get to it out in the loft. You've got this sort of processional approach to it, this restricted access. You can't get many people in chamber tomb. And there appears to be this concern with restricting and limiting access to who can see into Ellen Donald, who can be there, who can do things there. And the importance of the facade, all of these things, are formal similarities with chamber tombs. So this raises the, the, the horrible archaeological nebulous ritual kind of idea, you know? Um, it's not a practical site, so what is it? It's not a funerary site, it's not a domestic site. What we can say is it's a special place. It's a place of extraordinary duration, and there were great lengths gone to, to maintain it in that same form. The buildings were obsessively replaced 
uh, the hearts were obsessively replaced. The causeway was, was maintained, the frontage was maintained, the ceramics were maintained. This incredible conservatism over such a long period of time. There's this real sense of the community doing the same thing. Mike, Mike Cropper's PhD uh, on the pottery is called The Same But Better, which is uh, how he summed up the sort of attitude in the making of the pottery. Um, that that, that you, you constantly want to, to basically make the same kind of pottery, but you just want to make it you know, more of the same, better of the same, better quality, and so on. So you've got that conservatism, that social isolation, restricted access. It's quite small, the island, really. Um, everything that we know about it suggests that it was a consumer site rather than a producer site. You know, so um, food was consumed there in final stages of processing, but people weren't really kind of working the Ellen Donald, as far as we can see. So is it some kind of exclusionary space, a space that only certain people can go to, perhaps certain people at certain times? I'll just wrap up with um, talking a little bit about how it relates to wider developments in Neolithic Scotland, and this will be very brief. Firstly, as I'm sure many of you know now, uh, we always thought Ellen Donald wasn't unique, actually, because there's so many of these islands in the Western Isles. Uh, there's Ellen and Tia, not far from uh, from Loch Oliver, actually, that was excavated by Sir Lindsay Scott back, I think, in the 1940s, um, which produced lots of the same kind of decorative <coughs> pottery. Uh, as I said, Ellen Donald was really, really hard to, to excavate, and with the techniques that Lindsay Scott had available, he didn't really point out what he was digging through, but essentially it was the same kind of thing. And with uh, Duncan Garrow and Fraser Sturt's new project, Islands of Stone, uh, they've been finding, again, spectacular Neolithic pottery on a whole range of sites in island, island sites in Lewis. And they're coming here in July to look at El Donald and some other sites around it. Um, so these sites are not necessarily uncommon, spread across the interior of the US and Lewis. So they seem to play a part in relation to these Neolithic societies that are establishing in the islands in the fourth millennium BC. So maybe we could think about, I don't know, does every Neolithic community, every sort of founder community perhaps have one of these sites as a sort of special place that you use for certain things at certain times. <laughs> Just to make the point about where things have been going in terms of, I'm sorry about all the hours, it's not my, it's not my map, but uh, it's been 1930s actually, but anyway. Uh, this is just to show you the sort of march of Neolithic colonization across Britain. We've got the Neolithic in Northwest France by about 5,000 BC, just after 4,000 it's in Southern England, and Britain and Ireland about 3,000, uh, sorry, Scotland and Ireland, I should say 3,800. Um, the Irish house horizon, this creation of massive house structures in, in Ireland, exactly the same period that Ellen Donald was being established. And the arrival of, of the Neolithic farming technologies, farming practices in the Hebrides, best guess would be about 3,800, 3,700 BC. We haven't got to the bottom of Ellen Donald, but our dates are already in that ballpark. And I'd be willing to bet that if anyone years from now ever does get to the bottom of Ellen Donald, you know, it will be the beginning of the Neolithic. And the other thing to say about um, the other thing to say about this map is that we've got recent DNA evidence now. Um, ancient DNA has gone leaps and bounds in the last few years, and we can now get a lot of detail about individuals. We know that farming was introduced into Britain by and overwhelmingly by uh, migrating communities coming from Europe. There's a uh, over ninety nine percent genetic replacement essentially at the start of the Neolithic. Um, but what we do find are that the earliest Northwest Scottish individuals that we have DNA for who are coming from the Oban Caves, so not that far away, um, they all have an unusually high level of hunter-gatherer DNA. They've all got, you know, perhaps a grandparent or a great-grandparent at least uh, who was an indigenous Mesolithic hunter-gatherer. And what that and when we look at those dates, what that's telling us is that those two communities were still interacting with each other, still existing in the regions of Northwest Scotland in the period around 3700 BC. So we're right at the start of the Neolithic era, right at the start of the establishment of new way of living, new communities, new populations. And it's in that context that uh, Ellen Bono is constructed and occupied. So we don't know what the site is, really. We do know that it's not an obvious funerary site, and they had those, they were chained tombs. We do know that it's not a, an everyday practical settlement, but it does seem to be a, an integral part of a new, distinctive 
Hebridean Neolithic society. We don't know what became of hunter-gatherer populations. We think that they were numerically overwhelmed, probably, by incoming uh, Neolithic farmers. Um, but we do know that these populations mix in northwest Scotland, but no data yet in the Western Isles. Uh, there's not many human remains of that period around. Um, but is this hybrid culture, is this very distinctive Hebridean material culture something to do with the interaction of these two populations? Okay, maybe that's one for one for the future. Maybe Duncan and Fraser will get to the bottom of that. So I'm going to wind up with um, this, which I think is probably, much as I love Alan's reconstruction drawing, I think this is maybe a little more uh, kind of, uh, this is one that might copper produce this, a little more kind of evocative of what the site may have looked like at certain times. In other words, you can't see what's going on. We don't know what's going on at Ellen Donald, really. There's a big building in there. There's mysterious stuff happening. There's an odd little crowd of people and some smoke rising. But some of us can't really see what's going on uh, inside. Wait, I'll stop there, thank you.